Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you could all make it here with us today. Despite all the uncertainty going on around us, you all chose to continue learning and working on what is actually in our control to benefit society. So I really, really want to thank you for joining us here. Welcome to the Ohio State Zoom University College of Medicine. My name is Paul Nagib, and I'm a medical student here at Ohio State. It's actually the first lecture ever hosted by our consciousness research interest group. And I know our group lucked out attracting your attention. Dr. Davis is not only our advisor, but also happens to have conducted one of the most important psychiatric studies of the year. We're very thankful for the success of this important and very timely work and for the presence of each and every one of you here with us tonight. Again, welcome. And now for a few words about our speaker. Dr. Davis's breadth of work gives him a unique and extremely qualified perspective on all things mental health. For starters, he teaches undergraduates. As professor of social work, he teaches courses in psychology and research methods here at OSU. He's also taught, lectured, and mentored at the graduate and doctoral levels in classes, workshops, and seminars at schools such as the University of Michigan, University of Utah, Yale, and John Hopkins University. Dr. Davis has been invited to speak at renowned institutions internationally on his diverse research studies, including but not limited to psychedelic facilitated healing from racial trauma, mental health outcomes of psychedelic use in laboratory versus naturalistic settings, and quantum change following use of 5-MeO-DMT. Reading up on Dr. Davis's news interviews paints the picture of a grounded researcher that understands the revolutionary and controversial yet necessary nature of his work. He is mindful of the influence of his research in the bridging of science and faith, and has qualified the lasting mental health benefits and quantum change in subjects after their mystical and insightful experiences through psychedelics. Dr. Davis is the president and founding director of the nonprofit Source Research Foundation, which aims to connect, inspire, and fund students who study the many contexts of psychedelics. I highly encourage all student researchers with us here today to consider the Source Research Foundation to make their research ideas come to life. Stay tuned for more information after tonight's lecture. Dr. Davis graduated with a PhD in clinical psychology from Bowling Green State University in 2016, where he researched drug cravings, drug abuse, and harm reduction. After his clinical residency at the Baltimore VA Hospital, he completed his postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Michigan in 2017 at Johns Hopkins University in 2019. Tonight, he'll present his findings which have huge implications on the world's most understated epidemic. He will be speaking on a study he completed along with his team at the globally renowned Johns Hopkins Psychedelic Research Center, freshly published in JAMA Psychiatry titled, Effects of Psilocybin Assisted Therapy on Major Depressive Disorder, a Randomized Clinical Trial. We hope you'll join us in creating the space of questions and dialogue. The more questions you ask in the chat box, you can see it right there below, I see it's already active, the more we'll feel your enthusiasm through the screen. So please help me welcome Dr. Alan Davis with your enthusiastic attention. Thank you and enjoy, Dr. Davis. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for the lovely introduction. And thank you to everyone for showing up on this Friday evening uh, or late afternoon, depending on where you are, or I guess maybe middle of the night, depending on if we have any uh, international folks. Um, I'm really excited that, um, uh, that I could uh, be here today. And I'm really excited that we can present on this topic because it's such an exciting uh, paper to come out this week and our team is just really thrilled that uh, we were able to um, uh, to somehow wind up in JAMA Psychiatry, uh, which is an awesome, uh, I think, validation of some of the hard work that this team has been putting into uh, psychedelic research for the better part of the last two decades. Um, as Paul mentioned, uh, I will be talking a lot about the uh, paper, uh, and so you can certainly download and have that paper accessible to you. Uh, however, I'm also going to uh, share some other fun uh, results tonight, talking a little bit about some of our longer term follow up and also uh, share a couple uh, participant study uh, participants and talk about their experiences with uh, psilocybin therapy. 
as everything in academic science, it's all done within the context of a much larger team. And so I just wanted to point out that I'm here tonight representing our entire team of investigators and staff and clinicians at the Center for Psychedelics and Consciousness Research, including uh, my mentor and the director of the center, Roland Griffiths, and associate director, Matthew Johnson, faculty members, Fred Barrett and um, Albert Garcia Romeu, and uh, Mary Casamano, who is is our uh, Director of Guide and Facilitator Services, as well as uh, Nathan Cepeda, who is our data analyst um, on the team and, and was critical in helping get the depression study completed. Um, beyond that, there are a, a countless number of research assistants and interns who have been with us during the past few years helping this depression study along. And so I just wanted to mention that um, you can check out specifically who they were in the paper itself in acknowledgments, but I just wanted to, to highlight the importance of the team environment. Funding for this study specifically came from a crowdsourced funding campaign by uh, Tim Ferriss. And that uh, funding campaign uh, helped to launch the study. And then other funding helped to uh, see the study through to completion, including uh, individual donations by Tim Ferriss and Matt Mullenweg, Craig Nuremberg, and Blake McCoskey, uh, a grant from the Stephen and Al Alexander Cohen Foundation, the River Six Foundation, Hefter Research Institute. And during my time uh, in the primary part of this study, I was also funded by NIDA on a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship. So I'm going to start off by uh, opening this uh kind of starting at what I think is a, a, a nice place, which is what are some basic details about psilocybin? My assumption is, is that a lot of people who are here tonight already know quite a bit about psychedelics or about psilocybin, but that might not be the case. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what psilocybin is uh, and what types of experiences in general people report having. And then I'll tell you about the results from the study, uh, followed by the, the case reports. So what is psilocybin? Well, psilocybin is what we call a classic hallucinogen or classic psychedelic substance. And it affects the person in a variety of different ways um, from the uh, biological to the uh, neurochemical uh, and psychological. And one of the hallmarks of psilocybin experiences uh, is the acute mystical experience that is often reported by people who um, have a psilocybin session. Uh, we've certainly reported on this in a variety of uh, survey studies and prior uh, clinical studies that were conducted at Hopkins and, and other uh, institutions as well. Um, and the mystical experience is sometimes people refer to it as a spiritual experience or uh, perhaps a religious experience, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to have a religious overtone. Some people describe it as a transcendence of their usual self, uh, maybe a connection to something bigger than themselves, uh, feeling connected to the universe or perhaps some other kind of felt presence um, but it's one of the hallmarks is that it can be very difficult to put it into words. Um, and that's kind of the ineffable quality that's uh, reported from people. Um, in addition to this mystical experience, we also uh, have reports and, and had started more recently examining this in more detail. Uh, the degree to which people get insight uh, or what's colloquially referred to as downloads or new information during the psilocybin session. And it's not uncommon for people to report gaining awareness or realization or discoveries about their emotions, their behaviors, uh, perhaps a uh, new understanding about things that have happened to them in the past, uh, or maybe things that uh, they want to do in the future. Uh, but this new information, this insight, when it co-occurs with mystical experiences, produces something that we call quantum change. And that essentially is when insight and mystical experiences happen together. Um, unfortunately, we weren't the ones to coin this term. Uh, I do love this term, but uh, Bill Miller coined this term way back in 2001 in a book of the same topic where he talked about uh, rapid and enduring transformations that can occur in people's lives um, related to uh, these mystical and insight experiences. Interestingly, he wasn't uh, writing about mystical and insight experiences that people get during a psychedelic session. Uh, he was actually talking about it in the context of uh, people who misuse substances and who might hit what was kind of then and maybe even still today referred to as a rock bottom and where they kind of get this flash of insight, uh, a big kind of change, and then want to start making a lot of changes in their life as a result of it. 
Um, so in any event, uh, this quantum change model um, is something that I think can help set a foundation of understanding for what might be going on for some people in these psilocybin sessions. It's certainly not the only things that are going on, uh, but it certainly is uh, some of the more frequently talked about. So what are these psilocybin sessions? What is this intervention? I wanted to start off just talking a little bit about uh, what psilocybin therapy is, for those of you who uh, might not know much about it. Um, so the, the primary place that I think is a good place to start for that is to talk about safety. Uh, as you might imagine, in a clinical research context, we are very concerned about safety and we're, we're in fact, probably um, very conservative when it comes to screening people to come into the studies um, and wanting to make sure that they have a safe experience while they're there. And in part, that's because we give a rather large dose of synthetic psilocybin to people in this context. And so a lot goes into making sure that uh, we can avoid adverse reactions, uh, certainly try to avoid avoid serious adverse reactions, um, and if people have difficult or challenging experiences that come up during the session, that they have already built enough safety and have built enough trust and rapport with the clinical guides that they can uh, get through it. Um, and that's certainly why the guides or therapists are there with them. Um, so some of the things that uh, I've just mentioned, the mystical and, and insight experiences might be something that people would perceive as very positive, um, but difficulties and challenges can come up. One of the more frequent things that comes up is anxiety. Um, although usually transient and usually manageable, it can sometimes feel um, overwhelming for people. Um, the most likely associated thing that uh, people have kind of uh, connected to psychedelics is what's known as a bad trip. Um, now, I don't necessarily think that that terminology really fits for, um, uh, for use in clinical contexts, and in part because sometimes difficult experiences that people have are not necessarily bad. In fact, frequently we have people describe what sounds like um, uh, perhaps torturous or emotionally exhausting and draining um, physical and, and psychological experiences that they then, after it's over, uh, remark that it is one of the things that is helpful in transforming their mental health. Uh, almost like they've kind of gotten through this very difficult thing um, and in part that kind of helped them realize that they have more um, empowered uh, sense of themselves than they did before. So we don't call it a bad trip, we call them challenging experiences and that we believe that term helps to open up the possibility that the challenge might actually be part of the therapeutic value of the experience. Um, and because emotional experiences in general are often very intense during a psilocybin session, um, we want to make sure that everything that we've done up to the point of giving someone psilocybin is really in service of building trust and rapport and making sure that they feel safe. Um, and we also want to avoid things like dangerous behavior, people leaving, you know, under the influence of the psilocybin, those kinds of things. Uh, and it's for these reasons that we believe that preparation and integration therapy is critical. And that's one of the reasons why this is not called uh, psilocybin intervention, it's called a psilocybin therapy intervention, because we provide psilocybin in the context of uh, quite a bit of therapy prior to and after the psilocybin sessions in order to help people get ready for the session and then to help them make sense of it and kind of integrate it into their life afterwards. Uh, who you see on the screen right now is Roland Griffiths, uh, the director of the Center for Psychedelics and Consciousness Research. Uh, but where he is in that picture is one of our session rooms. At, it's one of our old session rooms. Um, but we have uh, several session rooms that look very similar to this, where uh, you have a couch, uh, kind of, you can't really tell with the cushions on it, but with the cushions removed on the back, it actually is a pretty spacious uh, kind of futon space. Um, there's art on the walls. There's... Uh, uh, side tables, uh, not your typical or what you might imagine as a clinical laboratory. Uh, but this is the type of setting that we believe is really critical to ensuring safety and making sure that people feel like they're in a second home or as close to that as possible. So one of the things that we do with each participant who comes into the study uh, is that we invite them to bring uh, 
anything that they want from their home when they come in for their session day. They can bring pictures, they can bring uh, things that will remind them of, of people that are important to them, uh, anything that they want really. And we've had people come in and bring dozens of things and fill up the entire room with their personal items and we've had some people come and bring nothing um, but kind of the basic room is already kind of set up to be this comfortable living room environment. Um, we think that this is uh, something that helps to decrease the, the possibility of acute distress. And again, the idea being is that, you know, people typically feel safe in home-like environments, preferably their own homes, uh, but the closest that we can get to that uh, is ideal. Um, and uh, we uh, want to avoid an overly clinical appearance um, in order to uh, reduce as much as possible the idea or the thought or belief or the feeling during a session day that they're being um, observed or that they're being watched or they're being examined. Um, we feel like that can sometimes get in the way of people just having whatever experience is going to happen with the psilocybin. And so that's another reason to try to reduce how much it looks like they're in a research study. Although I can tell you from experience that um, they never really forget that they're in a research study, uh, but they, they sometimes comment on, on feeling more comfortable because of the environment that we've created. Um, and lastly, uh, the, the people in the room, the therapists, the guides, the facilitators, there isn't really a common term yet to uh, describe who these folks are, are um, in terms of their training. Uh, for our studies, we always have um, two people in the room with someone uh, during the therapy as well as during the psilocybin sessions. Uh, we can't emphasize enough how important it is that that interpersonal atmosphere um, is created that develops trust, that en enhances the rapport and the feelings of safety among the person. Um, and in part, that's because if something were to come up during the acute effects of psilocybin, we want the person to feel like they trust the people who are there with them. And so the therapists or the guides um, are typically, at least one of them is a, tr a highly trained clinician, uh, either a master's level social worker, a psychologist, or a uh, psychiatrist. The second guide is sometimes another highly trained clinical professional, or we sometimes will have uh, research assistants or um, interns or, or practicum students in their uh, training uh, with us, but there's at least one uh, trained clinician in the room, and we always provide that second person with all of the training that they're going to need um, to be there and kind of uh, respond to any things that come up during the session day. Uh, so we, we think it's critical that monitors are knowledgeable, they have substantial human relations skills, and that, that, and that they're familiar with altered states of consciousness with some method of um, exploring that. And that can happen through meditation, through yoga, through breathing exercises. Um, we really uh, encourage the facilitators in um, on our team to um, have had those types of experiences in order to kind of understand the territory that people might uh, connect to in these uh, session days. And some of the considerations that we uh, certainly have heard other teams talk about are the composition of those teams. Uh, for, I believe, for some of the MDMA trials, they typically, although I don't think this is uh, unilateral anymore, but typically will have a male and a female uh, therapist pair in their sessions. Uh, we have not had um, this same uh, perspective in our studies and in our depression study in particular, we had all different combinations of pairings for our therapist guides, uh, men and women, uh, two men, two women, uh, different age ranges for the, the pairs, different sexual orientations. Uh, and we feel that there is, it's more important that you consider uh, what the individual who's having the experience might need in the session rather than predetermined notions of, of what we think they should have. So to the extent that we're able to and have different varieties of therapist guides um, on hand to work with people, we try to mix it up and, and really kind of make decisions thoughtfully about um, what the person might need. Uh, here's another picture of our, this is our other session room, and uh, you see Mary Casamano there holding the hand of a, uh, this is not a real participant, this is one of our interns um, who was with us a couple of years ago, uh, and Nate Cepeda is on the left there, 
another one of the co-authors on the study. Uh, but this is not an uncommon um, uh, look at what a session looks like, at least uh, some of it. Um, we typically invite people to have a blindfold on uh, as well as uh, earphones, and we play for them a musical playlist. Uh, it's a seven and a half hour long uh, day, so we have lots of music on the playlist, and it's going from the moment they walk into the room that morning when they show up for their session day, all the way through the end of the day when uh, their session is over and their pickup person comes to pick them up at the end of the day. Um, now, it's all over the place in terms of whether or not people get up or want to have the eye, the eye shades on or, or they want to maybe not have the earphones on, but this is our general stance and this is what we prepare people for. Um, our general belief about this treatment is that it's important for people to go into their experience, to focus inward, and to explore and experience whatever comes up inside their body, inside their mind, um, and to allow those experiences to unfold. Um, we want them to do that as opposed to, you know, getting distracted maybe by uh, some of the things going on in the room. Perhaps colors look a little bit different when they uh, look outside of the eye shades or uh, things may be melting or dissolving. And although that can be enjoyable, and we certainly encourage people to have moments of en enjoyment with their sessions, uh, we believe that there's a lot of therapeutic value that can come from going inward. And so that's the reason why we have uh, the eye shades and the, the headphones. All right, so that brings us to uh, the study. So that was kind of the framework that everyone comes into for really any of our psilocybin trials, but certainly for this one. And this study specifically was uh, a randomized waitlist controlled trial. And what that means is that we had people uh, enroll into the study and uh, were randomized into one of two groups, either an immediate treatment group that began treatment right away um, or a waitlist control. And I'll talk a little bit more about those conditions in just a moment. Um, we enrolled 27 people in this study uh, and 24 completed the study. And the primary objectives for us were to examine really whether psilocybin therapy was a rapid uh, antidepressant treatment, meaning did it, did it help alleviate depression quickly and to see how long it lasted. And we also were interested in demonstrating more data about the safety and feasibility of this intervention. Uh, for this first paper, we published uh, only up to four weeks after the treatment was completed. Um, excuse me. However, we, are, we followed them up to 12 months after the treatment was over. And actually today, uh, I'll share a little bit of some of those preliminary analyses just to give you a taste of how long, uh, how long the antidepressant effects might be lasting for the people in the study. So what you see on the screen is um, our flow of what it looked like for a participant to come into the study. So our screening process is quite extensive um, and we had quite a few people try to get into the study. Um, once they got in, if they were selected to enroll in the study, this is where they were randomized into either a delay treatment condition or a waitlist condition or an immediate treatment condition. Uh, it might look a little confusing right now, but this uh, treatment diagram is the same as this here. So they had the exact same treatment. The only difference between these groups is those in the delayed treatment condition had to wait eight weeks before they could begin their therapy. And the reason that we did this is because up to this point, there had been no control of uh, this treatment in people who had had major depressive disorder. And uh, this type of control allows us to uh, draw inferences about how effective this treatment was compared to just natural fluctuations in, in uh, someone's depressive symptoms. So for example, uh, you know, most of you probably already know that we found a significant reduction in depression. So a little bit of a spoiler alert for the uh, couple minutes from now. But um, what that helps us say is that it wasn't because of just, you know, time passing. It really was because these people got the treatment and these people didn't at first is why we saw that reduction. And then once people got through that wait list time frame, then they got the treatment just like everyone else. Um, so for this study, there were uh, eight hours of preparatory therapy that occurred prior to their first psilocybin session. And just like I mentioned earlier, that therapy is spent uh, getting to know people, uh, not only getting to know the participant coming into the study, 
but also helping them to get to know us as therapist guides because we want them to trust us and to feel safe and, and connected. And so it's a time for everyone to get to know each other a little bit and then quite a bit of time spent preparing them for their psilocybin session day. In this study, we had two psilocybin sessions. In the first session, participants were given 20 milligrams per 70 kilograms of uh, synthetic psilocybin. And between one to three weeks later, and we had you know, differences depending on scheduling and holidays and those kinds of things, but typically about one and a half to two weeks later, uh, they would have a second psilocybin session. And that psilocybin session had a higher dose. So we were giving people 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms in that second uh, session. Uh, and just for rough equivalency, 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram in general is about five grams of dried mushrooms. Um, of course, it's not exactly equivalent because we're using a synthetic drug versus plant matter, but uh, that's roughly the equivalent. Um, and then after that, we had therapy and depression assessments over the one month um, follow up. So what you see on this page is a lot of information about how, frankly, how difficult it was to get into the study. And this is not uncommon for psychedelic studies, but also for clinical trials in general. So we have to be very selective with um, the people that enroll because we have to make sure that they're a good fit um, for the study and that they don't have any potential um, uh, uh, potential um, things that are going on with them that could negatively affect um, their ability to uh, be in the study. Um, however, uh, one of the most common things that we excluded people for in this study was actually just geography. We had a lot of people interested in, in coming into the trial, uh, but a lot of them, in fact, most of them who screened for the study, and you see here um, 800 were excluded at that stage. Most of those people were excluded because they lived very far away from Baltimore. And we just, you know, this study involves many visits and, and obviously the session days. And so if they were too far away, we just couldn't bring them in for um, screening. We also excluded people for other reasons, including uh, the possibility of um, uh, having uh, perhaps a negative reaction to psilocybin, um, which has often been reported as people who have a family member or maybe even they themselves have had any type of um, uh, uh, other psychiatric problem that could interfere with um, their psilocybin experience. Um, and or uh, we also had a neuroimaging component of this study and people had to meet certain criteria um, to have the MRIs completed as well. Uh, so once we excluded uh, those people, we brought in 70 people for in-person screening. Those screening days are quite extensive. Uh, we spend two days with people uh, conducting a battery of medical, psychiatric, and psychological screening in order to understand whether they have depression, if they do have depression, what kind of depression they have, um, and to ensure that if they have other psychiatric or psychological problems, that they are things that are consistent with um, someone who's having a depressive episode. Um, everyone in this study had to be in a current depressive episode to get into the study, um, and most people um, had been having depression for a very long time. Um, of those 70, we enrolled 27, like I mentioned earlier, and 24 completed uh, the final study. And here you see there were 13 that were randomized and completed the immediate treatment group, and 11 that were randomized uh, into the delay treatment group. So who were these 24 volunteers? Um, well, all of them had moderate to severe depression. Um, and this was a depression that was rated in multiple ways, but we had for this study, what we call blinded clinician raters that did our official depression assessments. And what that means is that these uh, highly trained uh, clinicians had no other involvement with the study or with participants other than measuring their depression. They weren't told which condition they were gonna be in. They weren't told Told who the person was, what their um, any kind of identifying information. They simply met with them over the phone at different points in time and measured their depression using a structured clinician administered questionnaire. Um, so they were all at least moderate level of depression, although we had quite a few at the severe level as well. The average age was 39, 40. Um, we had almost two thirds of the sample uh, were uh, biologically female and 92% were white, 96% heterosexual. 
Um, the, uh, the average duration of depression that people had uh, been in in their current episode was 24 months. And as I mentioned earlier, most of these folks had been experiencing depression for a very long time. In fact, I would say certainly over half of the people in the study had had depression for decades. They had tried lots of things on average to try to treat their depression. Uh, many of them had tried medications. Uh, many of them had tried several medications over the course of their life. And some people had tried various forms of psychotherapy. Uh, and some people, we did have some who had never had any uh, medication or therapy. But most people had tried many things to, to treat their depression with, with little to no help. Um, now, some people may have had, you know, reported that some things helped for a little while, but almost universally people reported that if they had tried something in the past, you know, their depression came back eventually. Um, so what was our big finding from this study? Well, as I mentioned, you know, this study had a control condition which helped us to compare uh, whether or not the intervention was uh, effective compared to just natural passage of time. And so what you see here on the top row, this line, is the data from our delayed treatment group. And these folks were the people that were waiting those eight weeks um, to start the intervention. And what you see here is that their depression scores really didn't change. If anything, they just slightly went up uh, during that eight week period. The line in orange, or sorry, the orange squares, uh, that is our immediate treatment group. And what you see here is a large reduction and statistically significant reduction in blinded clinician ratings of depression. At, this corresponds to one week after their second psilocybin session. And that that remained uh, statistically decreased uh, at a large uh, effect uh, up to four weeks after the treatment ended. So this, this analysis allows us to say that um, uh, compared to no treatment at all, psilocybin therapy uh, rapidly decreased and sustained that decrease in depression up to four weeks after the treatment. So next, what we wanted to do was, uh, obviously, we gave everyone in the delayed group, we gave them treatment, and then we collapsed everyone into one group just to look at overall what their um, experience was. And what you see here, this is everyone in the study, once everyone had treatment, um, is we see the same pattern of effect with the overall sample, that across both conditions, psilocybin therapy led to a statistically significant and very large reduction in depression symptoms at one week after the second psilocybin session. And that at four weeks after the session was completed, that reduction remained uh, large and statistically significant. Significant. This is a different measure of depression, um, but we measured this at different times. And so it's important to show uh, that the changes in depression didn't just occur one week after both sessions were over. Uh, this measure of depression looked at one day after their very first psilocybin session. So what you see here across everyone in the study is that not only did things change um, after the treatment was over, it actually changed pretty dramatically within one day of their first exposure to the psilocybin. And of course, after about eight hours of therapy to prepare them for that session. Um, and that that pretty much reduced and stayed low um, through the four week follow up. So we measured this at the first day after their first session, one week after their first session, one day after their second session, one week after the second session, and four weeks after. So this line stayed low overall. Now, one thing I like to point out here is these bars are fairly wide. And the reason that's important is because this means that um, there was variability in response. Not everybody was this low. Some people were actually lower throughout the follow-up, but some people were higher than this. So it's not to say that everyone had the exact same reduction in depression. There was variability, but overall we see these statistically uh, significant decreases uh, throughout all of the follow-ups up to one month after the treatment. This is another uh, figure showing a different uh, side of symptoms. Uh, for those of you who know things about depression, uh, one of the things that's most commonly associated with depression is anxiety. 
And so we measured anxiety throughout the course of the study in order to see whether or not the treatment also had an effect on that. Uh, what you see here uh, is um, also a group comparison. The blue group is our delayed condition folks uh, who actually saw an increase in their anxiety during the waiting period, which as you might imagine, if you have been struggling with depression uh, for the most of your life and you finally get into a study where you've heard there might be some benefit and then you're told well, you have to wait eight weeks to actually start the treatment. Uh, it didn't surprise us that we saw an increase in anxiety here. Um, the green group here is our immediate treatment group. So what we see here is that they had a pretty um, large and statistically significant reduction in anxiety um, after the treatment was over compared to those in the wait list group. And what you see here is changes in suicidal ideation. So uh, many of you probably know that suicidal ideation and actually suicidal behaviors uh, is something that is not uncommon in the depressed population. Uh, it's, it's very common for people to have thoughts about not wanting to be around, uh, feeling guilty or feeling like they're a burden on others, uh, maybe even having active thoughts about death or thinking about ways to end their life. Um, in this study, we excluded people who had very serious uh, suicidal ideation, uh, in part because this is an outpatient intervention, at least the way that we designed it for this uh, study. And so we didn't have the resources to be able to work with people who were at risk of hurting themselves or others. Um, so people could have, what we call mild suicidal ideation, um, as long as they had had no prior attempts on their life or hospitalizations because of um, their suicidal thoughts. And so uh, even though we excluded a lot of folks, we still had people with suicidal ideation. Uh, and what you see in this figure is there was a reduction in suicidal ideation in both groups, regardless of whether they were in the waitlist group, which is the blue line, or the immediate treatment group. And what we think this is related to uh, is that once they get into the study, a lot of uh, participants reported a little bit of hope, you know, that they, that even though things hadn't worked well before for them, uh, maybe treatments hadn't helped them with their depression, that they had a little bit of hope that maybe this experimental treatment um, would help them. And that seemed to kind of in both groups reduce some of the, um, the mild suicidal thoughts that they may have been having. In terms of clinically significant response, so two of the metrics that we use to measure the efficacy of uh, psychiatric interventions is clinical response and remission. Clinical response is when there is at least a 50% decrease in depression symptom scores or the intensity of their depression. And what you see here is that at one week after the treatment, we had a 67% response rate. That means that two thirds of the people in the study were uh, uh, had a clinically significant reduction in their depression. And at four weeks after, we had 71% response rate to the treatment. In terms of remission, and remission is defined as the absence uh, of any clinically significant depression symptoms. It doesn't mean that they had no depression, although certainly some did have no depression, uh, but they had to score less than seven uh, on our depression measure, which indicates kind of non-problematic or non-clinically significant depression levels. Um, and at one week after the treatment, 58% of people were in remission from depression. Now keep in mind, these were people that to get into the study were experiencing moderate to severe depression and 58% were in complete remission from depression at one week. And 54% of the sample uh, were in remission at one month after the treatment. So I've mentioned a lot of the really positive things. Uh, it's important to remember though that uh, nothing comes without the possibility of adverse effects um, or uh, you might call them side effects. Uh, for this intervention, the most common side effect that people reported was a mild to moderate headache. And usually the headache comes on later in the day of their psilocybin session, uh, usually in the afternoon or evening after they leave the clinical site or it might happen uh, during the night or the next morning. Uh, but everyone who reports having this uh, either reports they it went away on its own, it wasn't very distressing, 
or some people will take over the counter analgesics in order to treat the headache. Um, but it's certainly the most common side effect that uh, people report in our studies. Um, what we also have shown in this study is a variety of other very rare, but a couple people reported things like uh, feeling dizzy, having a little bit of chest pressure, stiffness and soreness. Um, but again, these are very, very rare um, experiences. Uh, some of the other positive effects that people report are uh, shown here in this figure. Uh, it's not uncommon across all of our studies, both the survey studies as well as our laboratory studies, uh, to have people reporting psychological insight or challenging experiences, um, spiritually significant experiences, and personally meaningful experiences. And in this study, almost 100% of the people in the trial reported that their psilocybin sessions were among the top five or single most psychologically insightful and personally meaningful experiences of their entire lives. And this is usually contextualized within the frame of, of weddings, births, uh, children, uh, deaths of loved ones, um, but very, very meaningful experiences in people's lives. Um, and a little over half of the sample reported that it was also one of the top five or single most spiritually significant experiences and psychologically challenging experiences of their entire life. So coming back to that quantum change model that I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we wanted to test whether or not that model of you know, mystical experience and insight experience was related to the antidepressant effect of psilocybin. And what we found was that mystical experience was moderately correlated with change in depression at four weeks and psychological insight was strongly correlated with change in depression at four weeks. And both of these were in the, um, the, the more intense the mystical experience, the more intense the psychological insight that they got during the session, uh, the lower their depression scores were um, at the follow-up. So this is at least one data point that starts to um, elucidate that quantum change model and how that might be part of what explains uh, people's um, decrease in depression after having this therapeutic experience. We did not report our neuroimaging findings in this uh, JAMA study. However, we will be reporting those in uh, upcoming papers that we are uh, working on getting published right now. Um, for this study, everybody had a uh, MRI prior to starting treatment and had one one week after they finished treatment. And we did this because we wanted to explore biological mechanisms. Uh, the mystical experience and the insight experience are you know, fascinating psychological mechanisms, but there also could potentially be changes in the brain that are happening as a result of this treatment. And if that was the case, that would also help us to understand better what types of uh, mechanisms or explanations there are in uh, helping us understand why this treatment might be effective for people. And so specifically for people with depression, there's a lot of uh, published scientific evidence that shows that the part of the brain that responds to negative emotional things in one's environment, uh, that's the amygdala, this part of the brain is hyperactive in patients with major depressive disorder. So what that means is that this part of your brain that is kind of dealing with emotional information and trying to make sense of emotional things that might be going on around you, for example, uh, understanding people's facial reactions and interpreting uh, what emotions they uh, might be having and what emotions you should probably have in relation to that. This part of the brain in a depressed person is hyperactive and it's hyperactive attending to negative information in the environment. So someone who's depressed is more likely to, to see and pick up and perseverate on negative emotional information. Uh, if someone is standing in front of them who has a frown and someone is uh, standing to the side of them who has a smile, their brain is more likely, based on this scientific evidence, their brain is more likely to focus on the negative information, the person who's frowning. Um, so what we did in this study is we wanted to look at whether there were changes in the amygdala, in this part of the brain that it is over kind of overactively attending to negative information. Um, because that if there was a change, then that might help us understand maybe some of the biological mechanisms going on. 
So what you see here is a lot of information, but essentially what all of this boils down to is that we did see an, a, a decrease in the response to negative information at one week after the treatment. So we measured them at before treatment and after we saw that the amygdala's response to these negative emotional cues in the scanner had decreased. Uh, even more interesting is that the change in the amygdala response, the change in their brain's ability to pick up on this negative information was correlated to the decrease in depression symptoms. So the more their amygdala uh, changed its reaction to these negative um, stimuli, the more their depression reduced. So this negative affect finding or the, this finding that, that psilocybin therapy has affected not only their, the psychology of the person and, and given them these insightful and, and mystical experiences, uh, but it also seems to be affecting people on the biological level, at least with this one uh, finding. Uh, we also are looking at other um, things that may have occurred, um, but this is one of the first ones that we've explored. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I've talked a lot about data, and I love data. I think, you know, science is awesome. Hopefully most of you do too. Um, but uh, I think it's also important as a clinician, as a clinician researcher who does clinical research and uh, finds the, these interventions fascinating, to talk about some of the experiences that people had in the study to help, I think, enrich the meaning behind um, these findings and to make it a little bit more personal. Um, so I'm going to provide two uh, uh, descriptions of uh, actual volunteers. I've, I've changed some of the information, obviously, to make sure that it's still confidential. Um, but I've given you kind of the, the heart of kind of the experiences that these two people had. Um, the first person is a female in her mid-30s who immigrated to the U.S. Uh, she has been depressed for more than 10 years and has tried several other treatments uh, that she found unhelpful. Um, some of the interesting psychosocial factors that were going on for this person is that she believed pretty strongly, which we identified in the preparatory sessions, she believed pretty strongly that she's not depressed. That wasn't really the language she used. Now, obviously, she's coming into a study about depression, so she knows that this language is out there, but her cultural background uh, was such that that did not kind of comport with her own understanding of her mental health. And so uh, she still qualified for the study, but she believed that it wasn't depression. She believed that she was broken. She believed her mind was broken and that there was really no hope to be fixed. Um, she also believed that being broken was her fault. So she had an in incredible amount of guilt for having had this failing uh, and actually believed that the depression she was experiencing was a moral failing on her part. Uh, some of the other things that she was struggling with is that she lived currently with an emotionally abusive father, someone who uh, was very difficult to live with, um, and her parents were divorced. Um, she also had been experiencing chronic suicidal ideation uh, for the better part of that 10 years. Um, it had increased over time, uh, and there were a couple times where it got to the point where uh, she contemplated taking her own life, uh, but it really plagued her, these thoughts of just kind of not wanting to be around and, and just feeling like she would be better off dead. Uh, she was randomized to the delayed treatment condition, um, and so of course waited eight weeks after enrollment before um, having her session. So what was her session like? So this person, after the preparation was completed, uh, came in for their first psilocybin session. And we didn't know this was going on during the session because uh, remember they have the iPhone or the headphones on and uh, the eye shades on. Um, and this person was, was kind of quiet and, you know, as you might imagine, there's a lot of variability. Some people are laying there very still, some people are shaking and rocking and, and moving around quite a bit. This person was fairly quiet and so we didn't really know what was going on inside until later that day when they reported this to us. But she reported that for what seemed like hours and she said it was just seemed like it was many, many, many hours that she went through this, that she was being buried alive over and over again. She felt like she was being pushed underground 
into this kind of dark cavernous coffin. And every time she would kind of struggle in this being buried alive process to get to the surface, more hands would come and push her back underground to the point that she uh, was quite exhausted in fighting this process. And she said at some point in this experience, after repeatedly going through this burial process, she finally said that something in her mind told her to give up. She said, I, I had been thinking about ending my life for as long as I can remember. Maybe this is it. Maybe I just give in and just let myself die in this moment. And the minute she did that, she said that she immediately recognized that all of the hands that were holding her and pushing her under the earth were her own. And the moment she realized that, they all disappeared. And she emerged from this coffin in the, underneath the ground into the light. And, and it opened up and facilitated a whole different experience after that point. She said that she just felt empowered in a way that she had never felt. She felt that she had control, not only of her current experience, but also had control over these experiences she had had in the past, that she had more power to change them and to augment the course of her life than she previously um, felt like she did. After she came through that experience, she said that uh, at some point in the day, she became a dragon. And this was important to her because uh, she had spent several years at a job where she was experiencing incredible social anxiety, uh, which is not uncommon among people who have depression. And she said that it was debilitating to the point where she couldn't really uh, work well with others. She was kind of constantly uh, uh, doubting herself and found it very difficult to engage in her job. And it was a job that she actually really liked and wanted to be better at, um, but just felt like she couldn't um, because of this crippling anxiety. And in her psilocybin session experience, she said that at some point she became a dragon and she was kind of, you know, living her best dragon life and flying around and uh, enjoying the kind of power and majesty of that experience. And at some point showed up as a dragon to her work and walked in, kind of stormed through the doors and began to burn it all to the ground and eat everybody in the office as this dragon. And what was interesting is that several days after she went back to work, um, she came in uh, for a therapy session and said, oh my gosh, you're never gonna believe it. I went to work and I had no anxiety because the first thought I had was how can I be afraid of people that I can eat? And so, Ever since that point, her social anxiety had gone away, which was really fascinating. Uh, the last experience of this person uh, that I'll share is that she, in her second psilocybin session, uh, said that she became a fox queen. And she kind of, uh, kind of emerged into this uh, royal space as a fox queen with, with thousands of little foxes kind of surrounding her and worshiping her and idolizing her. And she said that it was the first time in her life that she ever felt like she was worthy of love and admiration. And that the feeling of love transformed her sense of what was possible for herself, that not only was she deserving of love and deserving of this adoration, but that she could take that with her um, into her daily life and feel connected to that sense of empowerment and deservingness of, um, of love. So what were some of the outcomes of this treatment for her? Well, there was almost no suicidal ideation um, since the second psilocybin session. There was a little blip um, of suicidal ideation that came up uh, during the 12 month follow up, um, but almost none for the whole time. And we found out later when that suicidal ideation came back up, it also kind of came up at a time where some of her, a little bit of her depression came back. And that was because she moved out of her father's house um, at about four to five months after the treatment was over. Um, and at six months after the treatment, she'd been offered a full-time job in her employer in a job she really wanted um, and that she had been working towards. And she was planning to go back to school in the future. So she had made these really big life changes around the four to six month time point. And of course that brought a 
little bit of fear, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of depression, but uh, what's really exciting and you kind of see here on this graph is that it didn't change the overall effect of the treatment. In fact, uh, when they came back for the 12-month follow-up, everything had kind of resolved um, and even though we see this blip in depression a little bit um, and suicidal ideation a little bit at six months, it certainly was far below where it was at um, enrollment into the study. And across all of these domains, we saw for this person a reduction in symptoms, in depression, in anxiety, in global disability and functioning, um, all the way through the, the one year follow up. Um, the next person that I wanted to talk about is a young male participant who had been depressed since adolescence. Uh, when they came to us, they were in their mid-20s, and they had not tried any medication or psychotherapy, uh, in part because they just were leery of it. And to some degree, they, they it had only been recently that they had come to uh, understand that they even were experiencing depression. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, they just thought that's kind of what life was. Um, and then, uh, you know, so we're just just really kind of accepting the fact that something might be um, going on there. Um, they had had an abusive childhood. Their parents were divorced. Um, they were also randomized to the delayed treatment condition. So in their first psilocybin session, and I'm actually just going to read um, their session report to you. So for every um, psilocybin session that we do, we have people um, the night after their session write down uh, in, you know, typically a Word document or they can handwrite it if they want, um, just a, a report of what happened. And they can, you know, describe it in as much or as little detail as they want kind of what happened. Um, so I'm going to read uh, this person's report to you. Uh, shivering cold. The concept of time is lost. Body is rocking, rolling, and writhing with the music. On inhales, I'm soaring up a mountain in the clouds in unison with crescendo. On exhales, my body and mind are slipping into a darkness and quiet that has no end in its depths. Other times, I feel the loud, turbulent, diffuse mix of thoughts, feelings, memories, anticipations, and the occasional moment of stillness. I felt an infinite series of expansions and contractions. I wanted to see and have ultimate realities revealed to me. I kept asking for answers, but I saw nothing. What I did receive was an internal brief feeling of peace, knowing, and understanding without really knowing what I was understanding acceptance. I thought the experience would have a deep, long-lasting impact on me, but at the time of this writing, I do not feel a strong emotional attachment to what happened, like it wasn't powerful enough to create a profound, noticeable change in me. I don't feel like I learned something clear and concise for me to take away, like it didn't make a powerful or lasting impression. I'm disappointed in myself. I felt like I was on the edge of something deeper, I felt like I could have seen or understood things more clearly if I was just able to go deeper. And in their second psilocybin session, this is their report from that day. The main theme of this session was healing and letting go. Healing came in many forms and in many feelings. I felt as if pain and sadness and trauma and guilt were draining from my body as if it were being washed away and cleansed. I felt guided and compelled to let go of hurtful memories and recognized it was time to let go and okay to move on from the past. I felt the music was playing an integral role in guiding where the healing needed to take place in my body, where it needed to take place in my mind and in my heart. I felt it flowing through my body as a bright silver light traveling where it needed to go and guiding my thoughts to tranquility and acceptance. I truly felt embraced and taken care of completely by some unnamed force. That force allowed me to open and willing to dissolve and dissipate the depression that was stuck in my mind. It allowed me to trust in myself and to be comfortable opening my once closed and guarded heart. I had a profoundly clear understanding that everything was happening exactly as it needed to be and everything will be okay no matter what. 
The first psilocybin session dramatically broke up and cracked and loosened all the stuck energy and rigid patterns of my mind. Once it was loosened up and broken, in the second session, I was able to clear all that once hardened debris free. Step one, jackhammer my mind and soul and show me I can survive that pain. Step two, gently and lovingly cleanse everything out and allow myself to let go and heal. I felt such a strong sense of soft, glowing, healing light, assuring me that there was nothing to fear or feel sorrow for. I felt I was in the presence of a pure and perfect energy that was healing me. I never once felt fear during the session. I knew I was gonna be okay. I am okay. And for the first time in my life, I discovered the possibility of what it feels like to love myself. I have never felt that way before. And I truly value the psilocybin journey for showing me that I can honor myself and others as equals on a deep and soulful level. And not that we needed data to show uh, perhaps how important that experience was for this person, but I'll show you the data anyway. Um, the data showed a very similar pattern to the last person I showed, which is a, a pretty dramatic decrease in all symptoms that they were experiencing um, after the treatment was over. And up to 12 months, they just continued to see slight decreases almost to nothing uh, in terms of their symptoms. Uh, it's really cool uh, when we followed up with this person because we meet with them at each of these time points and at the 12 months they had moved out of their kind of emotionally abusive home. They had actually moved across the country to take on a new education and work experience. Uh, they were really kind of moving forward in ways that they never thought possible for themselves and it was just really exciting to witness. All right, so what were some of the long-term outcomes from the entire sample? Uh, so this is overall for everyone who is in the study, what we have seen, uh, and we're gonna be hopefully publishing this in the next couple months, um, is that up to 12 months later, we see this overall uh, maintenance of the reduction in depression. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind here, these bars are still large. So there were some people, their depression came back, some people relapsed, some people relapsed pretty quickly, um, but we see that overall, um, it was still reduced compared to where the depression was when they came into the study. Um, across both conditions, we see a similar pattern of effect. So regardless of which condition they were, we see uh, that the depression dropped after treatment and overall was still reduced at the 12 months. In terms of clinical response and remission, what you see here, or sorry, this is specifically remission, what you see is that at 12 months after the treatment, we still have 58% of the sample in remission from their depression. Um, now, some of the caveats to this is that some people um, had gone back on medication, antidepressant medication. Some people had gone back to therapy in the year since their treatment. Uh, what's interesting though, is that almost everybody who was in remission from depression uh, had not gone back on medication. Um, meaning that the people that had gone back on medication were actually still experiencing depression, even on medication that excluded them from being considered in remission. Um, so these 58% of folks um, uh, seem to be, at least in our preliminary analyses, as in remission from uh, the treatment. All right, so where does this leave us? Uh, so as I mentioned at the very beginning, the mystical and psychological insight effects seem to produce behavioral and psychological changes uh, in these clinical trials, as well as in naturalistic settings. We've now published several studies looking at uh, people's change to uh, racial trauma symptoms, uh, people's change in alcohol use and drug abuse. And, uh, and it seems to be in, in all of these different ways, we keep seeing the mystical and insight or the quantum change uh, effects as related to uh, outcome. We also saw in this study that the, there were some uh, brain changes among these individuals. And that's a really promising, um, sorry about that. There's, that's a really promising step to help us understand some of those biological mechanisms. Um, and these findings taken together could explain a transdiagnostic mechanism of action. And that's one of the reasons why we're exploring this not only among people who are depressed, but also in other clinical populations. The psychedelic experiences that people have in this study and in others that we've published continue to show that people report them as some of the most psychologically insightful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. And again, that's taking into consideration major life events that people have. Um, 
comparing quantum change uh, will be really important uh, in terms of understanding what other features of these experiences people are having and how some people might have other ways of understanding how psilocybin was helpful for them. So exploring things like emotional breakthroughs, ego dissolution, or other fact factors could uh, be a really important next step. Uh, I certainly don't believe, and I don't think anyone conducting these studies believes that mystical and inside experiences are the only thing that people are experiencing. It just happens to be that those are some of the ones that we've spent time creating measures for and investigating, but there are certainly other experiences that people have, uh, and some people don't have any of those experiences during their session. So uh, the reasons why this treatment is effective are something that still deserves quite a bit of um, uh, focus going forward. Um, but all of this has led to current studies and upcoming studies uh, at Hopkins, as well as uh, here at Ohio State and a, at a variety of institutions around the world, uh, looking at psilocybin therapy for people with PTSD, with opioid use disorder, Alzheimer's, Lyme disease, um, alcohol and depression when it co-occurs, uh, and a variety of other um, types of problems that people have. And of course, we're, con we're continually exploring new topics. Uh, we currently have survey studies for people of color, uh, native Spanish-speaking individuals, and uh, hopefully upcoming this coming year, uh, we'll be looking at people who identify as LGB or T. So that's the main uh, th information from today, but I couldn't end without doing another plug. I know Paul did a great plug for Source Research Foundation, but I just wanted to share with everybody um, some of the wonderful, bright, uh, shiny faces of the folks that we've been fortunate enough to provide grants to uh, at the foundation. These are all students um, in, uh, mostly they're all in secondary education, or sorry, post-secondary education, uh, but they span lots of different programs. We have students who are funded in anthropology, in neuroscience and medicine and psychology. Uh, we have folks in counseling departments. We have folks in history departments this year. Um, we're just so thrilled that we've had so many applicants from a real diverse array of uh, programs. And we are excited because those programs have typically been underrepresented. And a lot of the folks that we've been able to fund have also been uh, underrepresented in psychedelic science. And so we're just thrilled about our mission to provide these grants to students. Uh, if any of you are interested or know people who are interested, you can find out more about us at sourceresearchfoundation.squarespace.com. Uh, our next round of applications will be in June 2021. And we're also launching in the spring a community grants program for people who want to bridge psychedelic science to their communities. Um, and we're going to offer specific awards for people of color who are, are also doing psychedelic research or wanting to bridge science uh, with their local communities. Um, I thank you again for attending, and I hope that this was uh, interesting and, and informative, um, and I'll turn it over now to Paul for uh, a moderated uh, Q&A session. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tonight's excellent discussion, Dr. Davis, and congratulations on this important work again. I'm sure we're all very excited to see where these efforts lead to. Uh, so cyber assisted therapy couldn't come sooner. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you again for tuning in. Uh, and before we move on, 